Hello, uh, today in honor of Halloween, I'm going to give you my thoughts about the supernatural. Um, so let's start with Halloween, I guess. That's probably the best place to begin. Um, so obviously, uh, most people celebrate it by wearing masks and trick-or-treating and parties. Um, but there is another side to it and I think like most holidays it has a deeper meaning Halloween or it's sometimes referred to as All Hallows Eve is the day before All Hallows Day which is also sometimes called All Saints Day or All Souls Day um, and Apparently the words uh, hollow and saint are synonyms, so they, they're kind of interchangeable. Uh, so the whole time um, that happens over the course of these, there's actually eight days, is called uh, All Hollow Tide or Hollow Miss. Uh, so if you know Christmas, it's sort of the same idea. Um, and the purpose is to remember the dead but I think that that's kind of a, only one part of it. There's, there's a whole thing. So the Gaelic people call it Sawin, uh, but I guess most people think of it as Samhain or pronounce it Samhain. In some countries, it's also called the Day of the Dead. Um, so it lasts eight days and I guess hundreds of years ago they used to say it was an octave. They called it an octave. So I think that's kind of an interesting idea. Um, you know, these holidays, people I think think of them as just something you do. Uh, but I kind of see them from a point of view of like a force and many times they see it as sort of a tide. Uh, and I like that idea more because it kind of, a tide implies pushing forward. And in this case, I think it's actually very applicable because it's sort of like the tide of spirits. Um, and, you know, they called it an octave hundreds of years ago, these eight days. And I think that musical quality also has an interesting idea idea about it because it sort of goes in line with the harmony of the spheres or something like that where uh, there is kind of a mathematical purpose behind everything. Um, anyway, the time, this time of year is when the sort of portals uh, open to the other world, to the spirit world. And the veil between the material world and the spiritual world or afterlife sort of thins. Um, I'm a teacher and sometimes when I'm describing Halloween uh, to uh, students in Asia, it's kind of difficult to explain. So often I'll draw a Venn diagram on the board of sorts. Um, and it looks something like this. And as you can see, um, I've sort of split it into three sections, three main sections. The realm of the spirit or the religious side, the philosophical or the realm of the mind or the thoughts, and then the scientific or the realm of the physical, or you could say the material world. And obviously these things overlap. Um, so I sort of see it as the calendar shifts these worlds kind of become closer together uh, and you know according to legend spirits come through and you know like there are a lot of things that we use to represent that uh, idea and maybe like the jack-o-lantern you know it kind of uh, scares away the ghosts or keeps them at bay and our masks are sort of meant to also scare them off but it also can be a thing where it uh, doesn't recognize the living because the person is wearing a mask. Um, and if you go back quite far, there are times where people have made sacrifices, even human sacrifices, and appeasements to the gods. Um, 
in this time to sort of keep the dead at bay. And I think it's a very interesting idea. And as far as like how that relates to me with the supernatural, um, I think, you know, in my experience, there is a murky area between our minds and sort of time and space. I know most people have this sort of concrete idea of the material world, but I feel like it's much more complicated than that. Um, and, you know, I've done a lot of research into alchemy, and there are a lot of interesting diagrams and ideas in alchemy about how the worlds interconnect. And I think they're very applicable here. Uh, if you see this diagram I have here, it's uh, the pentacle and it shows all the different elements, uh, air, earth, fire, water, and spirit, and how they're interconnected. So, you know, most people think of the elements as the four elements, um, but if you consider the fifth element as spirit, then there's an interconnectedness to that. So, I think in Halloween that becomes more prevalent. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to think of our consciousness or even the consciousness of the universe like an onion. So, like an onion, there are sort of layers. And, um, you know, in my research of, of alchemy, I discovered the Hermetic Principles. And I think these help define the spiritual world a lot. So uh, here are the seven principles, mind, correspondence, vibration, polarity, rhythm, cause and effect, and generation. So, you know, most of these work as a duality, um, a negative and a positive. And to think that there's no spirit world would be ridiculous in my opinion because everything has to have an opposite so if there's a material world there has to be a spiritual world um, and you know the polarity of the two things uh, can shift maybe uh, where one is more powerful than the other at certain times people think of reality as a consensus something that we all agree on but we all have different states of awareness depending on certain conditions there are many different states that you can get into that help you see different parts of reality. Um, one would be uh, fasting. Um, I've fasted before in the past and during those times I've had what I could only say would be like miraculous things happen. Communication with separate, a separate consciousness from my own times when people have done hallucinogens or psychoactive plants I have several stories about those times that um, defy explanation and I could really only describe them as being supernatural moments uh, and you know I think one of the most popular um, alter mind-altering substances is alcohol and you know I think most, not everybody, but many people drink alcohol. Uh, but in Arabic, apparently it's it means the ghoul, <laughs> which I find very interesting. And it translates into body-eating spirit. Uh, and it's also obviously why we call them spirits. And so, you know, in alchemy, uh, alcohol is used to extract the soul essence of an entity or a substance. Uh, most of us have had nights we haven't remembered what we've done or uh, where we went, like our consciousness. Um, and I think in those situations, people would just say, oh, I was drunk and I passed out or I don't remember what I did. But I believe that it weakened your mind, your connection your body's connection to your mind so much that something else was able to get in for a moment and maybe not take absolute control of you but 
have some kind of influence on your psyche uh, where you end up doing things that you might later regret or that you don't remember. Um, so, you know, I think any experience where you sort of lose yourself uh, can help you touch the spiritual world. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell you about a few experiences that I've had uh, that, you know, have made me believe that this actually exists. So the first one I'm going to say is uh, a story from my childhood, which I was, I guess I was a teenager, I was probably about 11 or 12. And my dad uh, married my stepmom at the time, and he moved into her house. And her house is a very old house. And the first time I went there, I just, I didn't like it. <laughs> there was something about it, there was something very um, domineering about it, and I especially didn't like the basement. The basement was sort of like a, almost a crawl space, like a, a little bit larger than a crawl space. The ceiling was quite low and it just felt wrong somehow. And whenever I would go there, uh, I just could never sleep well and I just felt at odds with it. Um, but I think that that space you know, I think the house is probably maybe close to 100 years old, I'm not sure. But you can definitely feel that someone had died there. At least I felt that way. Maybe I'm sensitive, I'm not sure. But every time I walked over sort of the threshold of the door into the house, it always, it almost seemed like it would kind of come in on me. I think that was one of the first moments where I felt a presence uh, and I wouldn't call it like a personality or something like that. It was more like a presence of doom or um, something heavy. Um, a bit after that, uh, actually quite a bit after that, I would say I was in my late 20s. I was living in Detroit. And in Detroit, there's a lot of um, ruined buildings. And often people will buy these buildings and sort of refurbish them and uh, flip them, as they say. So my boss at the time was one of these people. He would flip these houses, and he flipped a funeral home. And uh, a guy I worked with was renting the funeral home as a house. <laughs> and probably not a good idea to begin with, but... Um, so, you know, it... It was a strange place. Uh, because it was a funeral home, it had this sort of vibe. When I walked in, I immediately felt it. And um, you could actually go up into the other area where they did the preparation. Uh, so that was very strange. And uh, one night, uh, my friend was saying, oh, you know, we should do uh, a Ouija board. And you know, at the time, I didn't really, I mean, I knew what it was, but I wasn't um, as versed in it as I am now. So I was like, okay, sure. Uh, I was with my girlfriend and his girlfriend were there and we were having a few beers and um, chatting. And so we didn't actually have a, a Ouija board there. So we had to make one and we made it out of a, a piece of glass a piece of paper underneath the glass and we used a CD to kind of as the planchet. Um, and at first uh, nothing really happened and we were sort of joking around and it seemed very silly but after a time we actually got in contact with something um, and there's more to this story but um, It's too, too large of a story to say the whole thing here, but um, we definitely made contact with something and it was talking to us. Um, it said many, many things about having died there or near there 
and you know that area um, where the house was was actually near a very famous um, like axe murder <laughs> so there was definitely this sort of ominous vibe around that street um, and uh, anyway we just didn't we didn't really know what we were doing but we definitely got in contact with something and this lasted for quite a long time um, that initial night was maybe an hour and subsequent uh, contacts I made with this uh, were over the course of several years. So you could say it's my own subconscious or the subconscious of the group, uh, but I experienced it and I can't say that that's what it was because we all were there and that's just what it was. So uh, another experience I had shortly after that with the same uh, girlfriend, um, we decided to take Amanita Masaria mushrooms. And they're the big ones that are like the red with the, the dots. Uh, and it was an odd experience because you know, I've done other psychoactives in the past and with many of them, you are very conscious of what is going on. Uh, in this case, you'd sort of lose consciousness, uh, but then you would start saying things. And strangely, we were each either losing consciousness and waking up. It was almost like we were taking turns. So when one of us was awake, we were trying to write down what the other person was saying. And there was many, many, many strange things that were, that were said. Uh, just like cryptic messages, like something about being a king from another time. And uh, one thing was like two birds, one stone, like just all this strange sort of lingo. Um, and after it was done, we shared, you know, we talked about it and we shared the experience and it was just really intense. Uh, and I think, I don't know what it was. I mean, I wouldn't say it was a ghost or something, but I think the supernatural is a very broad term. I mean, it was probably some kind of nature spirit or the spirit of the mushroom. I'm not sure, but something happened. Um, and, you know... A final story I'd like to say, this is one that's a little darker, I feel like. Um, I was <laughs> on LSD, of all things, and um, my friend and I went to this uh, dance club. I was probably about 26, maybe, 27. And um, we were there, and, you know, when you're doing something like that, it's better often to be in a, a room with people you know or whatever. Um, but in this situation, I was in this huge room with many, many, many people. And I was standing there and this, I just felt this sort of odd sort of nagging. Uh, and I sort of scanned the room and then I saw this guy and he had like dreadlocks and he had these big pants on. The pants were like really, really big. And he just, he was dancing, but he was dancing in this really odd way. And something about him, I don't know if it was the substance I was on or, or what it was, but the, the, his presence was just dark. Like, like I could kind of see through him. And, you know, I think when you meet most people, you know, everyone has a dark side, but uh, their dark side is kind of I wouldn't say it's like evil, you know? Whereas this person felt evil to me, like like almost not a person. Um, and I watched him for a long time and 
it, you know, he just sort of stood there and danced and did this kind of hypnotic thing. And I, I just thought I was looking at like a demon or something that just wasn't a person. And, you know, I talked to my friend about it and he just thought the guy would look kind of strange. But there was something very deep there that I've never forgotten, uh, and it's definitely stuck with me. You know, I think we go through our lives and there's a lot of um, bad things that we see. When I lived in Detroit, I saw many bad things, but you know, I've seen some bad things in other countries. Uh, and a lot of those things are just like someone needs money or you know they're you know they're doing hard drugs and they they're desperate there's a lot of desperation but the the vibe i got from this guy was not desperation it was just like sort of unadulterated malice or like evil or something uh it was, it was quite scary actually uh and i've never really seen that since um that was the only time i can say where i've felt i mean the experience inside the house when I was a uh, teenager, um, that there was a certain malevolence to that building, but seeing it in a person was a much different thing. And I, you know, I just think it sticks with you more. Um, but you know, I mean, you could easily say I was just hallucinating and that it wasn't real, but in my heart, I know it was real. And you know, our, Sixth Sense has uh, the ability to save us from danger, and I definitely felt danger from that person. Um, and, you know, how does it know? How does our Sixth Sense know these things? I don't know. But, you know, I think that the supernatural, uh, you know, it can't be explained, but that doesn't mean it isn't real. Um, there's a constant fascination in every country in every time, uh, there are stories in every mythology. Um, there are countless stories of people encountering ghosts or spirits or demons. Uh, so, you know, I, I've had many people laugh at me when I say things like this, but, you know, it's good to follow your own intuition, your own heart. And if you feel something like that, Sometimes I think that's more pure and there's more truth to that than, it, than any kind of data. So, um, with that said, you know, I've never seen a ghost, <laughs> so I can't, uh, I have no idea if that is real or not. Um, I suspect it probably is because there are many accounts of people that have. Um, you know, there's lots of things I've never seen that I still probably think are real. Um, you know, I think it's easiest to look at it like this. If you think about reality as like a pyramid or an iceberg, right? Um, and the part that we see is the tip uh, and that's at the top, right? And that's the part that we see but there's a whole vast part of the hole underneath the surface, under the water or under the sand. And it's sort of the foundation. And it's kind of scary. I mean, it's like the underworld in mythology. Um, it's this deep level of consciousness. And if you think of consciousness as like an ocean, then I think it's very plausible for things to kind of bubble up and come out of there. Um, and at this time of the year, you know, when they say these sort of worlds touch, it makes me wonder about the possibilities. Uh, so I'll leave you with this. Um, in ceremonial magic, they say that the magician must perform a banishing to get rid of harmful spirits, right, before they do any kind of magic. Um, and if you look into like the Hermetic Order of Golden Dawn, uh, a lot of them were spiritualists and, um, you know, if you look into 
how many famous people were in this group, all these writers, philosophers, artists, um, are all these people crazy? Um, this is just a tip of the iceberg of the people that have done this. Uh, you know, there's rock stars from like the 60s and 70s and filmmakers and all kinds of people who uh, believe that there's an occult world. Um, and I don't think they're crazy. So I'll leave you with that. Happy Halloween.